Good morning, everybody. This is the Mac Road Church of Christ Wednesday Luke study. Luke 7, we're in Luke chapter 7, verse 24. We had no recording last week if you were looking for one. I was out of town, uh, but we're glad that you're back with us today and pray that the Lord blesses you. Let's go ahead and have ourselves a prayer. Lord God and Father in heaven, we just praise you and thank you for every blessing. We thank you for the forgiveness of our sins that we have in your son, Jesus. We thank you for the uh, safety of our trips and our journeys when we travel from place to place and and the way that you keep us safe. Uh, We're thankful for the church that's here. Pray that you would bless us and help us to glorify you and honor you and all that we do. And help us as we study the book of Luke to uh, learn some things about you, Father, so that we might better serve you and know you and you might know us and we might be able to uh, spread your kingdom throughout the world. We thank you for all things. We praise you uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we are in Luke chapter 7 and down to verse 24 is where I left off. Is there anything anybody would like to mention or say that uh, maybe you learned something that you want to share with us in between the time that Loreto and I were teaching this? Uh, anybody have anything that needs to be mentioned or said? All right. Uh, then let's, let's go ahead and have ourselves uh, a little bit of a study as we take a look at Luke chapter 7 and... Getting down here to verse 24. And what we've noticed is that Luke chapter 7 is basically toward the end of what we call the Sermon on the Plain. In the very last part of chapter 7 and verse 1, uh, he talked about the centurion servant that's being healed uh, and the, the proof that Jesus really is, is God and that we can build our life on him. That was the last part of the Sermon on the Mount. And then he also raised the uh, widow's son. Uh, We had that in verses 11 all the way to verse 17. And then we spent some time talking about the message that John sent or the messengers that John sent uh, about the uh, kingdom or about whether Jesus was the one or not. Remember that last time that I was here, we talked about the idea that John was in prison and he was saying, are you the expected one? And he was kind of unsure. Who remembers why he was unsure? Since he's the one who identified Jesus, well, why was he unsure? Who remembers? There you go. So he's in prison, and that goes against John's idea of what the kingdom was going to be. And so he's wondering if Jesus is the one or whether there's somebody else coming. And Jesus pointed out to him or pointed out to his disciples all the things that he did, the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed. And the poor have the gospel preached to them, and he said, blessed are those people who don't stumble. And then he sent John's messengers back to him, basically to tell him what what they saw, so that John would know that Jesus really is, in fact, the one. Now, the way way John was going to know that was from the Old Testament scriptures. And so we need to remember that sometimes our ideas of what God's supposed to do is different than what God planned and what God said. And so we need to change our thinking about what what God's mission is instead of trying to change God and conform him to our thinking. And so in verse 24, Jesus is now going to begin talking about John the Baptist. He's going to begin talking about who he is and and some things about him. Now, uh, as he he does this, I'd like to suggest to you that that what's going on here is really the, the same thing that was going on with the discussion about, are you the one? That is that John was trying to figure out if Jesus was the one, and he was a little bit apprehensive, a little bit concerned, a little bit confused, maybe had some doubts. Uh, And in verse 24, we're going to be talking about John, and I suggest to you that what he's doing in this section, or at least what, what Mark is recording for us, is that if they accept John for who he is, that he's a prophet of God, then they should accept the one who is coming after him. And that's what this section is about. So this section is about the people accepting the message of God so that they can see who the one is, like John had to see who the one was by looking at the scriptures. And so in verse 24 of Luke chapter 7, it says, when the messengers of John had left, he began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? Uh, a man dressed in soft clothing? He says, those who are, spl- who are splendidly clothed and live in luxury are found in royal palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I say to you, and one who is more than a prophet. 
This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. I say to you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John, yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And so as Jesus now begins to talk about uh, uh, John, <coughs> he, he tells them that after John, John's messengers left to take G, uh, John the answer to the question that he asked about if Jesus was the one, that uh, uh, Jesus then basically says about John, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken in the wind. In other words, the, the people had gone out to see John in the wilderness, right? And so why did they go see him? What was it they were looking for as they would go out to see John in the wilderness? Uh, what, what are they trying to find? There's, you, you know, you, you, you don't go, excuse me, you don't go into the wilderness, into a, you know, a deserted area just for no reason at all. There has to be a pretty good compelling reason as to why you would go. And so basically what Jesus is saying is, look, you guys went to John. You went all the way out in the desert. You took your time out to go out in the desert and to be baptized by him, to listen to his message. And many of you were baptized by him. And so he says, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? Why did you go out there? Well, he said, did you go see a reed shaken by the wind? In other words, he says, did you go because there was this man out there who was, wish who was wishy-washy? who would go along with the fads and the movements that were going on in the world? Is that why you went to go see him? And, of course, the answer to that is what? No. Okay, so some of these questions are rhetorical, but you have to understand why he's saying them. So what he's saying is, is you didn't go see John in Luke chapter 7, verse 24. He says you didn't go see John because he's just, he's just going along with the fads and, and you like what he's saying because he's going along with the fads, but you went to go hear somebody who had a stance. He took a stand for something. His, his teaching uh, uh, was indicative of a certain principle, and that's why you went out to see him. You didn't go see a reed shaken by the wind. Verse, verse 25, but what did you go out to see? So then why did you go see him? If he, if he wasn't conforming to all the fads that are around, then why did you go see him? He says, well, what did you go see? A man dressed in soft clothing? In other words, he said, did you go see somebody who was who was uh, uh, living a soft life, a, a life of luxury or a life of pleasure, is that why you went to go see him? No. Now, some people, that's the kind of life they like. That's the kind of life they want. They, they, they want to go to a resort all day long and, and for months at a time and just sit back and let little, you know, hold up the little, uh, 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 um, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, hold, hold up the little flag where the, where the little towel guy comes or the pool guy comes and, you know, he gets your drink and you sit there and you bathe in the sun and, and you relax. And, you know, and that's okay for a little while, but uh, some people think that's what life's about. Life's about getting there and, and being able to do that all the time. Well, that's not John. You didn't go see John because he was this person who, who, who lived this comfortable life. He, he wasn't dressed in soft clothing. He says, those who are splendidly clothed live in, uh, uh, and live in luxury are found in royal palaces. In other words, those people who live this kind of way, you don't find them in the desert. You don't find them in a secluded place. That's not where you go. You know, if you're going to go to a resort, you go where all the people are, you go where the buildings are, you go where there's, where there's uh, a, a, a service and there's room service and there's, there's restaurants and, and, and you just go. That's not John. John wasn't living that kind of a life. So when they, when they went to go see him, they didn't go see him because he was going to give them a comfortable life. Well, why in the world would you go see somebody if they're not going to give you a comfortable life? Why, why in the world would you go do that? Well, he says in verse 26, but what did you go out to see? A prophet. He says, so why was it that they would go out to see him? If he wasn't going to give them this life of luxury, if he wasn't going to give them soft clothing, if, if he didn't go along with all the fads of the world, then why would you go hear him? And the answer was because he was a prophet. So Jesus is talking to those people who have a religious or spiritual mindset in their head. These are individuals who are going to go see him because he's a prophet. There's not a lot of people who are going to go see somebody because they're a prophet. But the ones who go, why are they going? Because they're going, they want to know something about God. Because they want to know who God is, and they want to find a prophet who can tell them. Uh, it's kind of like in Washington, D.C., there's a museum that's called the, the, the Bible Museum, 
and it's got all the books of the Bible, and it's got manuscripts and all sorts of stuff. Uh, who goes there? People who are interested in the Bible. Uh, I think in Kentucky they have the what they call the Ark Experience. Some guy actually built a replica of the Ark, and, and there's all kinds of information there about uh, about the Ark and how many animals it could hold and all that stuff. And, and, and my son's gone, uh, and, and it cost them quite a bit to go. Why would they go? Because they're interested. So when he's talking here about what did you have to see, he says you guys supposedly went to go see John because he's a prophet and you're interested in spiritual things. So if you're interested in spiritual things and you're going to see you're going to see John, then something should follow along with that. Um, in in verse in verse 26, he says, "What did you go out to see? A prophet." And Jesus goes, "Yes." And I say to you, and one who is more than a prophet. So you went to go see John, not only because he was a prophet, but he was somebody more than a prophet. Now, how can somebody be something more than a prophet besides being God? How can somebody be more than a prophet without being God? You know, we look at God and we say he's more than a prophet. But here it says that, that he was more than a prophet. How can you be more than a prophet unless you're God? Well, he's a messenger of God, yes. He has to be spiritually gifted. Well, be spiritual. well, weren't all the prophets? Weren't all the prophets spiritually gifted? Isn't that what made them a prophet? No, no, John. Talking about John the Baptist. Yeah, yeah. How, how was John the Baptist more than a prophet? He was a predictor. Prophecy fulfilled. Okay. He was a forerunner. Even the prophets prophesied about John coming. John wasn't just a prophet that showed up. The prophets prophesied about him. The, the book of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 40 talks about that there's going to come one who's going to be proclaiming the good news and somebody's going to follow him. In Malachi, it talks about the fact that uh, Elijah would come before the Messiah would show up. So, G, so John was more than a prophet. He, he was somebody that the prophets even prophesied about. And the reason he was more than a prophet, he tells us in verse 27, it says, this is the one about whom it is written, behold, I send my messenger before, his, uh, before your face. So uh, uh, John was prophesied in the book of Isaiah. And as you read the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 40, here's that section that deals with what we call the section of comfort. Remember that Isaiah wrote right here, when Israel was about ready to go off into captivity, Judah was going to go off into captivity about 130 years later, and, and Isaiah's writing right here about the fact that they're going to go off into captivity. They're going to be punished because they had become idolatrous and weren't serving God. But then God was going to comfort them. God was going to restore them. And that's what you have in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 1. In Isaiah 40 and verse 1, it says, Comfort, O comfort my people, says, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that, uh, that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sin. So certainly that's talking about in the physical standpoint that they were brought out of, uh, out of Babylonian captivity, that, that they were allowed to go back to their land, they rebuilt the temple. Now remember, that's just the beginning of it. The real restoration is for the Messiah, because when they came out of captivity, they didn't have a Messiah. They didn't have the, the promised kingdom, but they had everything else as far as the land, the, the, the temple, and all that. And so God's saying that, that, that he has forgiven them after he sent them off into captivity, he brings them back. And somebody's going to be crying something. Verse 3, a voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low, and let the rough ground become a plain, and the rugged terrain a broad valley. In other words, he's, he's going to have a forerunner who goes before him. That's why John is, is more than a prophet. He's also the forerunner. He's the, run, he's the one that's going to come before the Lord, and he's going to be the one who is going to preach his word, uh, or is going to preach or announce his coming. Now, what's interesting about John, that the, uh, that the other prophets... Uh, did was that John never did a single miracle. John never did a single miracle, but yet Jesus says he's more than a prophet. And the reason he's more than a prophet is because he's the one who's going to announce the coming of the Lord. He's the one that's going to announce and be the forerunner for the Lord showing up. And so he's, he's going to uh, um, 
fix the roadway. And of course, the roadway for God is the hearts of people. Now, after he does that in verse 5, <clears throat> then it says, Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And so he says that uh, right after him is going to come who? The Lord, right? They're going to see the glory of the Lord. In verse 6 it says, A voice called out. Then, then he answered, What shall I call out? All flesh is grass, all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. Well, what's the message that this messenger is saying? People aren't here forever. People are like grass and like flowers. They bloom, they get pretty for a while, and then they get old and they die. He says that's the way people are. What he's saying is don't put your confidence in people. Don't put your confidence in a preacher. Don't put your confidence in somebody who calls himself a pope or a bishop or some. You don't put your confidence in men. It's not where your confidence is. That's not what, what uh, John the Baptist was coming to do. John the Baptist wasn't coming to set up a hierarchy John, uh, wh where men rule, but he was coming to tell us what it is that is the gospel. In verse 9 it says, Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bear of good news. There's the gospel, good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bear of good news. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the city of Judah, here is your God. That's his message. So his message was, here is your God. We sometimes think the gospel is, I'm going to get to heaven. It's not the gospel. Now, that might be a result of the gospel, but that's not the gospel. The gospel is, is God's kingdom is going to come. That kingdom that God promised to David way over here, when he promised it to David, that David would have someone who would sit on his throne, and yet God was also going to be involved in this individual, and he was going to be both God and Christ, or sorry, I mean, he was going to be both divine and human, and so Jesus was born into the world. He was born of the family of David in order that when he was raised from the dead and sat on the, thro on the throne of heaven, he would be fulfilling the promise that was given to David. That's the good news. And by the way, this good news is right now. Right now is the good news. The good news is Jesus' kingdom is here. God's kingdom is here. And you and I are supposed to preach that kingdom. And as a result of that kingdom, and if we stay faithful to the king, then we'll get to go to heaven. But the gospel isn't I'm going to heaven. The gospel is we have a new king, and he set up that kingdom, and you and I can be part of it. And as a result of that, the king will bless us, and we'll be able to to have an eternal life with him. But the good news is the kingdom of God is here. So if Jesus is talking about John the Baptist to the people that he's talking about, he's trying to get them to understand, just like John had to understand, that Jesus really is the one. And basically what he's saying to them is, look, if you guys have been following John, and many of Jesus' disciples came from John, uh, if, you, if you remember when uh, John first identified Jesus, there was a couple of his disciples John said to his disciples, look, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world, and they then began to follow Jesus. So a lot of the, the people that were following Jesus had first been, been uh, uh, introduced to him by John the Baptist. And you remember what John the Baptist's message was, right? What was John the Baptist's message? Well, it was repent because the kingdom of God is here, and someone is coming after me who's laces I'm not worthy to untie, he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. He's the one that can bless you or curse you. That was his message. So a lot of those people then would come, to, would come and, and they would be following Jesus. And he's trying to get them to understand, do you really know who you're following? Do you really know who John was pointing to? Do you understand that he's the forerunner? See, that's, that's what John's question really was too. You know, I've been preaching, and you followed me, Jesus, but are you the one? I saw you get baptized with the Holy Spirit. Are you the one? And so John had to figure out, is Jesus the Messiah? And Jesus is now telling the crowds, you should know that I'm the Messiah because you guys gave your attention and your obedience to John. You didn't just go out to see some guy dressed in soft clothes. You didn't go out to see some guy who just preached to you what you wanted to hear. You heard a prophet. He was a prophet of God, and he told you what God wanted you to do. And so, therefore, if, you li if you're listening to him, then you should certainly accept the conclusion of his preaching. And what is the conclusion of his preaching? 
that Jesus is the one. Jesus is the Messiah. He came before Jesus, and, and, and he, he announced Jesus. He announced that Jesus was the one. Jesus did all those, all those miracles that proved that he was the one. So if you guys are accepting John, you need to accept the conclusion of John's teaching, which is Jesus saying, I am the one. You guys are unworthy to tie my shoes, but yet I'm down here with you. Because I want to bless you, and I want to, and 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 and, and I, I want to be the one who takes care of you as you serve me and, and as you listen to me. And so then, in verse twenty-eight, it says, "I say to you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he." And so Jesus then goes goes on to say that of those born of women. Now, there's a couple of ways you can take that. You can take this to mean that that. John was the best human being that ever lived. Um, maybe that's the way he has it. But the context seems to imply that, that John was the best prophet. He was more than a prophet, right? So he was the best prophet. Now, why was he the best prophet? Well, because he got really, really close to the kingdom of God, and he could even announce the kingdom of God. His message was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And so he could get really close to it. But what happened to him before Jesus was crucified? What happened to John the Baptist? He died. So he didn't quite reach it, but he was the one that got the closest of all the prophets. He got so close to it. But what was it he was close to? The promised kingdom of God, that, that God was going to set up David's king or David's son as king on a throne who would rule the entire world, and John was that close to it. And so when he says here, I say to you that among those born of women, there is no one greater than John the Baptist, yet he, he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So he's saying, if you're in the kingdom of God, then you have received the blessings and the privileges that John the Baptist was just announcing and telling you about. But if you're in God's kingdom today, then you're receiving the fulfillment. You're in a greater position than that of John the Baptist. John the Baptist could only announce it. You and I are actually in it. We're receiving it. We're, we're, we're part of God's kingdom. We're, we, we have received the fact that we believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead and that we're part of his kingdom. That's why in Colossians chapter 1, and down here at about verse uh, 12, <coughs> it says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. So there's, there's an inheritance that you and I share in because we're saints of light. He says, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So as a result of being in God's kingdom under God's rule, what is it that we have? Forgiveness of sins and, and the hope of eternal life. We have redemption. He's bought us back. He's paid for the price. He's paid for the price for our sins so that we can be part of, of his kingdom and enjoy the blessings of being under his rule. And that's the idea that, that's under consideration. And so Jesus is basically telling them that if you have been following John, if you've been following John, then you have to logically conclude that I am the person who's coming after John. I am the one who's coming, and the one who's coming is supposed to be the glory of the Lord, it's supposed to be God. The message was, here is your God. That's the message of the gospel. All right. Now, look at the reaction, looking at the, look at the reaction of the people when they hear this. <clears throat> he says, when all the people and the tax collectors heard this, they acknowledge God's justice, having been baptized with the baptism of John. So the people that heard John preaching, when they heard John preaching, what did the people do? They were baptized. They were baptized in the baptism of John, right? And John was saying to them that there's going to come the one who is going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. He's coming. And they believed John. They believed that that, that was going to happen. And that's why, they, that's why they were being baptized. 
And so it says, when all the people and the tax collectors, and it's interesting that he lists all the people and the tax collectors. Why do you think he listed the tax collectors? Did he owe money? Did he need to pay some taxes? Why, why do you think he listed tax collectors? Because you're like a whole set of different people? Because they, they were a class that was looked at by the Jewish people as sinners and unworthy of the kingdom of God because they were traitors and they were helping the Roman Empire, and so certainly they can't be in the kingdom of God. But it says, but when, when all the people and the tax collectors heard this, they acknowledged God's justice. Well, how did they acknowledge God's justice? By be, having been baptized with the baptism of John. So they had heard, they had heard John uh, even maybe before Jesus started his public ministry. And they were baptized by John, waiting for the Messiah, waiting for the expect, expected one to come. Now, what's interesting is, where's the religious people here? Where are the scribes and the Pharisees? Well, look at verse 30. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by John. So, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, the scribes, the Pharisees, the lawyers, those people who were supposed to know the law, those people who were the religious leaders of their day, when they heard John the Baptist's message, what did they do? They rejected it. Now, how did they reject? Do you think they, they, they came up and said, said, John, you're, you're wrong, you're, you're awful, you're not doing what, what God wants you to do? Is, is that the way they rejected it? They didn't do it. They didn't do it. Matter of fact, uh, um, Luke chapter, uh, chapter 1 tells us that the Pharisees came to see John the Baptist, and they asked him, are you the one? And he goes, no. And they said, are you Elijah? He goes, no. And they said, well, who are you? He said, I'm the one announcing the coming of the Messiah. But they never, they came to see what he was doing, but they never came to be baptized by him. Well, why not? Why wouldn't they be baptized by him? But what was it they didn't believe? Well, that's true. But what was it he was saying that they didn't believe? These people who were baptized, why were they baptized? I, I, I know it says the kingdom of God was coming, but why were they baptized? What? For the forgiveness of sins. They were being baptized because they're sinners. And they, and they need to get ready before the king comes because they want to be in a right relationship with him. Well, then why didn't the scribes and the Pharisees get baptized? They don't think they're sinners. We're, good. we're religious, man. We keep the Sabbath. We, we fast. We tithe. We give. You know, we do everything God says. We're, we're good. And they don't recognize that they're sinners. And yet, and yet that's exactly what Jesus is trying to point out here to them. Is he's trying to help them to understand uh, the, the difference between those people who believe John's teaching and the conclusion they should come to, and the scribes and the Pharisees who rejected it. Now, here's the other thing that, to notice here, is that in verse 30, it says, but the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for them. What's God's purpose for everybody? To be saved. Now, the, the Calvinists would tell you, no, 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 God's purpose for the scribes and the Pharisees here was to just condemn them because they're wicked and they, and they can't, can't do what's right because God wasn't going to save them anyway. So really the purpose for God for them was just to destroy them. God wants all men to be saved, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8. God says that he wants all people to be saved. It's not that God rejected them, it's that they have rejected God. And if you reject God, well, then you're like Adam and Eve in the garden. If you don't listen to God, who are you listening to? Satan. You're listening to Satan. So you either listen to God or you listen to Satan. You might say, no, I don't listen to Satan. I, I listen to politicians or I listen to science or I listen to, well, if they're not telling you what God says, who's leading them? Satan. Satan. And you're following Satan. And so we need to be individuals who are following Jesus. Okay. But uh, one of the things this, this shows us is that the scribes and the, and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by John. So they didn't obey. They didn't want to get baptized. They didn't see the need to have their sins forgiven. Uh, and, and so therefore, 
<clears throat> they didn't follow him. But the, but the people and the tax collectors, they acknowledged God's justice. They recognized that this was God's way to make them right. You see, Jesus coming in his kingdom is how God is going to make us right. And all the people back over here that he'd forgiven, all of them were going to be, be made right through the blood of the king who was going to be sitting in heaven. And what's really interesting is that king is God. And he willingly gave up his life for us. And that tells you the difference between his kingdom and the kingdoms of the world, which is why God didn't want them to have their own king, because their kings, physical kings, are going to do what from you? They're going to take all your stuff, right? And they're going to take more and more and more all the time, right? And it never seems like they have enough. They take more and more and more and more. That's not what God, that's not what God does. God blesses us. God gives us everything to enjoy. And yes. God is actually interested. That's right. That's exactly right. Leaders, things like that, and kings, they're not interested in anything. That's right. All right. So these that so there's these two classes of people. You got one class that's following John. Their, their conclusion should be that Jesus is the one. He, he's God. The Pharisees don't follow John. Their conclusion is we don't think he is, right? <clears throat> now, look at what he then says in verse 31. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. There's unrighteous pe there's uh, righteous people who think they're they're not sinners, and there's sinners who think they're righteous. And so you got to make sure that we're doing what God says, right, to figure that out. All right, verse 31. <clears throat> he says, "To what then shall I compare the men of this generation?" Now there's these two groups of people. He says, "So what shall I compare them, and what are they like?" So you can say, "How do I compare these two people?" You have one group of people that that's following John. And the conclusion should be that Jesus is the Messiah. You have the other group of people who aren't following John who really don't care. And here's what it says. He says, they're like children who sit in the marketplace and call to one another. And they say, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not weep. For John the Baptist came eating no bread and drinking no wine. And you say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and you say, behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So let's explain this first before we read that last little verse. Uh, so in verse 31, he says, what can I compare these people to? He says, they're like children in the marketplace. In other words, when, when your parents would go to work, they would go to the market, they'd sell stuff. And you're, you being a kid would be hanging around there, and all the kids would get together. If, if you didn't have to do any chores there at, at wherever your parents worked, all the kids would get together, and they would try to figure out, you know, let's play a game. And so it, it says, he says, they're like children. These guys are like children in the marketplace, and they call one another and say, hey, uh, we played the flute for you. In other words, they said, let's play the happy game. You know, we'll play the flute. We'll have fun and have a happy game. And they said, no. They didn't want to dance. They didn't want to dance. Okay. And he says, so we'll sing a dirge for you. We'll sing the sad game. And they go, no, we don't want to weep. Well, let's see. If you don't want to play the happy game, you don't want to play the sad game, what in the world are you doing here? Why are you over here where we're going to be playing? If, if you don't want to play, why are you here? And that's what Jesus is talking about when he says to them in verse 33, for John the Baptist came eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say he has a demon. So they say they look at John, the, the scribes and Pharisees, they look at John, and, and, the, and the world kind of looks at John and go, he's weird. He dresses funny. He eats funny. He lives in a funny place. It's kind of like sometimes there's some Christians who... Uh, look quite different than the rest of the world. And the rest of the world goes, they're a, they're a Jesus freak. They're, they're, just, they're just crazy. They sell their, they, they sell their stuff. They, they don't have property. They're willing to give it away. And, and so the world goes, that's crazy. We, we don't want to do that. That's an odd duck. That's right. That's an, that's an odd duck, right? And, and, and so he says, and, and you think he has a demon. You go, that guy's nuts. He's crazy. So, so they don't want to be like him. 
Now verse 34. And the Son of Man came eating and drinking. And you say, behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard of friends of tax collectors and sinners. He says the Son of Man comes and he enjoys life. His, 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 uh, uh, he turned water into wine. You know, that, that always gets some of our brethren who, who uh, say that you can't have any alcohol at all whatsoever. Then why in the world did Jesus turn water into wine? Yeah. What, what in the world was that all about? Well, it's because Jesus doesn't conform to these standards that we put of what's right and wrong. But the religious people, they go, oh, wait a minute. You know, you can't have any wine, so Jesus turned water. So maybe, you know, we can't follow Jesus because he's partying too much. He has too much fun. You can't be religious and have this kind of fun. You got to be, you got to be austere and you got to be sad. But yet John was austere and sad and they didn't follow him. So Jesus says, I don't get you guys. And then, enough. I'm sorry. It's never enough. That's right. And so he says, behold, they, they accuse Jesus of being a gluttonous man and a drunkard, you see, he drinks, and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. He associates with, with uh, uh, um, worldly people. I mean, he did eat dinner with worldly people. He taught worldly people. He talked with worldly people. I'm afraid our problem is that we have become so religious, we're too good to talk to worldly people. So we just keep to ourselves and don't say anything to anybody. Yes? Do you think they had a misunderstanding of what a perfect man was? I'm sure we do. And I'm sure, I'm sure they do too. Yep. So, look at verse 35. Yet wisdom is vindicated by all her children. You might say, what does that mean? Well, what is wisdom? What does wisdom mean? I'm sorry? The truth of God. The tr okay, so certainly the truth of God's included. Knowledge, but above knowledge. Well, it's the, it has something to do with knowledge. I've told you before. Try to give, make it easy for you. Wisdom is the use of what you know in a way that leads to a blessing. So a wise person is somebody who uses what they know that results in a blessing. I know how to use a gun, so boom, I'm going to kill you because I want your money. Is that, is that wise? No. But I, I know how to use a gun, so I'm going to go out and hunt so I can shoot a, a, a rabbit for my family so they can eat. Is that wise? That's wise. So it's using your knowledge in such a way that it leads to a blessing. So when, when Jesus says, yet wisdom is justified by her, is vindicated by her children. In other words, what Jesus is saying is, look, but wisdom's children, those people who, 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 who have wisdom, they are going to respond to wisdom in the proper way. Those people who are not children of wisdom, they're not going to respond in a proper way. Just like these, like these scribes and these Pharisees, they thought they were the wise ones. They thought they were the intelligent ones. They, they have the degrees. They have the, the education. They have the learning. They have all of this stuff, and they consider themselves really wise, but they don't accept John the Baptist, and they don't accept Jesus. So God says, well, wisdom is vindicated by her children. They were relying on their own understanding. Right. Exactly. And so the idea is, is that a wise person who's looking for God is going to respond properly to what God says. Just like if John the Baptist was a wise person and he hears what his disciples come back and tell him about Jesus, what's he going to do? What's John going to do? Remember, he's in prison. He's going to accept it, isn't he? he he's going to accept it and say, okay, well, if God wants me in jail and if God wants me to die... That's fine. I'm going to trust what God says. And that knowledge will lead to a blessing. But if John goes, no, I don't like being here. No, I'm not going to listen to what they tell me. No, I don't care what they say. Is he going to be wise? No. Is he going to be a, a wise, a, a child of wisdom? No. But wisdom is vindicated by her children. In other words, the, the, the people who respond in a wise way indicate that they're doing that because of wisdom. Yes, somebody have a hand up? Well, it, it, it applies to everybody who's, who's listening to men instead of listening to what God says, or at least listening to men and not filtering it through what God says, because that's what we all got to do. We all, we all have to listen, and then we have to filter it through what God says. 
That's right. So people who just listen and accept somebody because they like him or because he's handsome or because he's got this nice, nice speaking voice or because there's, he's got this big, huge building and a lot of people come to see him and they just follow him because of that. Well, they're not following God. Matter of fact, Leroy and I were talking before you guys came in about the fact that, that uh, sometimes people want to come and they just want to be entertained. And, and, and they really don't want to know what God says. They just want to feel good about what they're doing. Kind of like when Jesus said, did you go out to John and see a reed shaking in the wind? In other words, did you go find somebody who would tell you what you want to hear, who would give you the fads of the days and go along with the fads that are going on? Is that who you went to go hear? He says, no, it's not what a prophet does. A prophet takes a stand and tells you what God says, even when nobody else does. And so that's what's under consideration. All right. So any any thought on that? <clears throat> Sometimes uh, you, you just have to tell the truth even though it hurts people's feelings. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah. Uh, now, but the Bible does say we speak the truth in love. Right. You can speak the truth in a way that you can just hurt somebody. Or you can speak the truth in a way that is more palatable and it's easier for people to accept. Right. And, and so it's not our job just, you know, if, you know, if, when, when, when your wife or your, or your mate says, does this make me look fat? The answer is not yes. The answer is, there's other dresses that make you look better or that flatter you more. There's so, a difference between destructive and That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I know, but I also know the consequences of what happens when you do that. <laughs> no, it is true. Verse 36, Luke 7, 36 says, says, Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. All right, so here is a, here's a, here's a golden opportunity for us to see how the scribes and the Pharisees value Jesus. A Pharisee asked him to come and eat with him. Here's what it says. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner, and she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, and she brought an alabaster vial of perfume, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, <clears throat> she began to wet his feet, <clears throat> with her tears, and kept wiping them with the hair of her head, and kissing his feet, and anointing them with perfume. Now, let me tell you what's going on here, in case you don't know. You can, well, I read it. I know what's going on. Well, we read it, but I'm not sure we know what's going on. Okay, first of all, do you remember when Jesus was uh, had the uh, Lord's Supper? Remember when Jesus had the Lord's Supper? Right. Remember one of the things that Jesus did during the Lord's Supper? Why, why do you wash their feet? Because they're dirty. He washed their feet because their feet are dirty. That's the general courtesy that you give to a, some, to a visitor when they come into your house. That's the general courtesy you do for them to show them that you they're your friend and you care about them. When they walk in, you wash their feet. If some guy's delivering you know, a package to your house, you don't wash his feet. He's just going to be there for a minute. He's going to leave. You don't really care who the guy is. But if, but if you have a visitor and you invite him in, the courtesy is you wash his feet. The courtesy is you give him the common courtesies and respect. Now, he's entering into a Pharisee's house. Nobody and nobody washed his feet. Wash, yeah. right. Nobody washed his feet. That's because they're a bug. No, well, maybe. <laughs> I'm talking their attitude. Right. But right here, why do you think that this Pharisee might not have given Jesus the common courtesies of a friend. Because what? He didn't deserve it? No, no. no. They're afraid that if they give Jesus common courtesies, their other Pharisee friends are going to what? He's your friend? You wash his feet? You like that guy? You're part of him? You... That's what they're going to say. That's right. How, how it would look. That, that's what they're going to say. How, how would it look? Right? Sometimes people do that in church. 
You can't have that young man read the Bible. He's not a Christian yet. How's that going to look? Why, only Christians can stand up here and do stuff. And then they have to wear a suit or they have to be all dressed up or they have to, they, they have to look decent in order for all, all that to happen. Well, why, why do we do that? Because we've made this into church. Yes. We think this is what church is. Instead of this way, we come to learn about stuff. Yes. <laughs> right. It brings Tristan up. Absolutely. Exactly. Right. But what I want you to understand is that's what's going on here. It's not just about the woman who's washing his hair. It's about the fact that the Pharisee did not give Jesus the common courtesy to indicate that he was his friend. And he didn't do it because there was other Pharisees around. Matter of fact, look at what happened when the woman who did give him the common courtesy, look at, what the, look at how they responded to her, verse 30, 39. But uh, now when the Pharisees had invited him, uh, saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this was. Yes. What were they concerned about? How it looked. See, they're concerned about how it looked. So I'm certainly not going to invite Jesus into my house if I'm a Pharisee and wash his feet because of how it might look. It might look like I, I'm actually in agreement with him. It might look like I actually accept him. And then my Pharisee friends are going to get all upset with me, so therefore I'm not going to give them the common courtesy. And it happens today. It happens today when one of your friends takes the Lord's name in vain and you don't say anything. I'm not going to say anything because if I do, it might make them not like me. Yeah. And that's what you have going on here. That's what this story is about. It's not just about a woman who washed his feet. Now, let's see why this woman washed his feet. Let's see, let's see if we can understand what's going on in this woman's mind that she doesn't care about what other people think of her relationship. Let's see what happens. Verse 37. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. Now, apparently everybody knew she was a sinner. Now, I, I would suspect that the only way that somebody would know that she was a sinner was like if she was a prostitute. Everybody knows that, you know, that's pretty open. They would be doing it in public. So everybody would be aware of, oh, yeah, she's the, she's the local prostitute here, right? Uh, you see them on the street. And so you would know, oh, yeah, there's a sinner. So I'm suspecting that's probably what she was, although it doesn't really identify her, except to, to tell us that she was a sinner. And it says, and there was a, a woman in the city who was a sinner. So she recognized her sin. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, he brought an alabaster vial of perfume. So when, he, when she knew that he was there, she was going to do what was necessary even if it costs her something, to show her respect for him. That's what this is showing us. Respect always requires something. It requires something of us. Here, she was willing to give up her uh, um, vial of, of uh, her alabaster vial of perfume. It, this was very expensive perfume. It wasn't something that you just, you know, threw around. Okay, it wasn't like, it wasn't like Brut or, you know, one of those kind of colognes. It was very expensive. And it says in verse 38, and standing behind him. Now, wh why would she be standing behind him? Because he's sitting at the table, probably with his feet like this. He's sitting on his, he's sitting on his, kind of on his, on his legs like this. His feet are back here behind him, okay? Because remember, they sat on the floor or on a cushion. And so his feet would be behind him. And so she comes up behind him. Um, and it says, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping. So she's crying. And she began to wet his feet with her tears. So she began to cry. Maybe the tears fell on his feet. And he, she looked at his feet and noticed that they hadn't been cleaned or hadn't been washed. Right? And it says, And she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with, her, with the hair of her head. How's she going to look when she leaves? Ladies, how is she going to look when she leaves? So her hair is going to be all frizzy and all over the place. And, of course, that's the way you guys want to look, right? No. You, you, guys, you guys spend lots of money at the, 
at the uh, beauty parlor so that you can look like that, right? Your hair all frizzy and all dirty, and, and that, that, that's why you spend a bunch of money, right? No. You spend money so your hair looks nice. Bed hair. That's right. She, she, she was going to look like she had bed head. And not just bed head, but dirty bed head. Because she was, she was using her hair to wash his dirty, his dusty feet and her tears. So she wasn't concerned about what people thought about her. Yes. That's right. That's right. We, we don't know how much perfume that was. <laughs> At least it smelled good. <laughs> Might not look good, but it, but it smelled good, right? Okay, but, but, but you have to see that. This is what's going on as, the, as he's sitting down at the table with the Pharisees sitting around the table who didn't care about giving him anything, who didn't care about any sign of respect, and here comes a sinner who's willing to wash his feet with her tears, wipe his, his dirty feet with her hair to, to dry them off, and then it says uh, in verse 38, and standing behind him at his, at his feet, weeping, she began to, to wet his feet with her, with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. He was kissing his feet. Pharisees wouldn't even wash him. She was kissing him. And then she took the perfume not just water, not just tears, but she took her expensive perfume and poured it on his feet. And I can imagine as she poured them on, she just, just dumped on his feet. I can, I can see her there rubbing them into his feet. There you go, that's right. Okay. While, while they're sitting at the table with this Pharisee sitting around judging what's going on. They didn't show many courtesy, except other than, come into my house because I need to talk to you. Okay. And, verse 39. Now, when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what, kind, what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. You see, their idea was Jesus can't even associate with sinners. And associate with them. That if he was really a prophet, because that's what they're trying to figure out about Jesus. Is he really a prophet? They're saying if he's really a prophet, he would know who this woman is. That's exactly right. Isn't that the same thing that we do to our students? We don't think that we can make them the same Jesus too. That's exactly right. Yep. All right. Now, verse 40. And Jesus answered him. Now, Here's my question. Did they ask Jesus that question? They just made a blanket statement. They, they, it says he said it in his head. He said in his head. If Jesus knew what kind of woman this was, he wouldn't let her touch him. But now, he's going to answer them. How does Jesus know what they're saying? He must be a prophet. They're saying he's not a prophet. They're saying he's not a prophet because he's letting this woman wash his feet. But yet he knows what you're saying. Yeah. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. We're going to learn from you. Tell us something. We can learn. Learn. A moneylender had two debtors, and one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So, which of them loved him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more and he said to him, you have judged correctly. If you owe somebody five bucks and you owe somebody else $10,000 and the $10,000 guy forgives you, 
Who are you going to love more? The guy who, who forgave you 10,000 bucks or the guy who forgave you $5? 10,000 bucks because this guy's really, this guy's really generous. This guy's really gracious. You know, he, he, he really cares about me. And that's what he says. And Simon said, I suppose the one who, who, whom he forgave more. And he said, Jesus says, you have judged correctly. You have said right. And turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, who's the Pharisee, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with the tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. And you did not anoint my head with, with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason, I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. And that's where we have to stop today. Any questions or thoughts? All right. Now, here's your lesson for today. Go out and love a bunch. Love a bunch. That means if people mistreat you, love them anyway. It means if people owe you money, forgive them. It means if people hurt your feelings, forgive them. Go out and love a bunch. Because that's what Jesus would do. All right, let's have a prayer. Father in heaven, we're just thankful for all you do for us. We're thankful that you show us how to be like you, how to be like your son, and that you've demonstrated to us your graciousness and who you are. And we pray, Father, that you help us to acknowledge you, to recognize you, to hold you up and to honor you, no matter what people might think or say, or no matter how we might look. We pray, Father, that you'd be glorified in our lives because you have forgiven us much. We praise and thank you for all things. In Jesus' name, amen.